Good morning, and I hope it's as a wonderful morning wherever you are tuning in as it is right here in Fairbanks, Alaska at First United Methodist Church. My name is Francis. I'm the choir director here, and we have a wonderful service ahead of us, so I hope you stay tuned in and listen to all of our wonderful music. We have a variety of music of all kinds, and we have Pastor Bob giving us a lovely sermon. We are welcoming you with our whole hearts, and we pray that you go away from this service with the love of God filled in your hearts just like ourselves. Please join us in singing, I Am. joining us here at First United Methodist Church in Fairbanks, Alaska, just below the Arctic Circle on this Sunday, October 10th. Today, we're going to continue in our sermon series on the losses and lessons of Job. And today, again, we'll observe Job complaining, complaining that God is not answering his questions. Yet sometimes the best questions go unanswered. Sometimes the best questions have no answers. They only lead to more questions and questions that are easily answered sometimes weren't worth asking for in the first place. So let's join in Losses and Lessons of Job.
please join me in the opening prayer. O oh God, we thank you for your word and for the eternal truths that guide us day by day. We thank you most of all for the living word, Jesus Christ, and the sureness of his presence. Teach us how to turn onto you so that your thoughts may be our thoughts, and your ways, our ways. Amen. Now listen for a word from the Lord as I read from Job chapter 23, verses 1 through 9, and verses 16 through 17. Then Job answered, Today also my complaint is bitter. His hand is heavy despite my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his dwelling. I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would learn what he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Would he contend with me in the greatness of his power? No, but he would give me heed to me. There, there an upright person could reason with him, and I should be acquitted forever by my judge. If I go forward, he is not there, or backward, I cannot perceive him. On the left he hides, and I cannot behold him. I turn to the right, but I cannot see him. God has made my heart faint. The Almighty has terrified me. If only I could vanish in darkness, and thick dark darkness would cover my face. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In 2015, comedian, English comedian, and actor Stephen Fry, a, a self-declared atheist, was being interviewed by an Irish broadcaster, and the broadcaster said to Fry, suppose it's all true and you walk up one day to the pearly gates and you're confronted by God, what will you then say? Fry responded, Bone cancer in children. What's that about, God? How dare you? And in the interview, Fry went on to mention a number of things about the human condition that humans, in his opinion, have no control over and repeatedly asked God, how dare you? And then even got more daring and asking, why, why if such a God existed, why would I even respect such a God who creates a world that's so full of injustice and pain. Now, the idea of confronting God with questions like this is nothing new. It's been done in, in books, in theater, in movies. 
You can form your own opinion about Fry as a thinker, but you can resonate, and many people do, with the questions that he would ask God if he could. Many of us also have had similar thoughts. So let's indulge ourselves for a moment and imagine that we could go to heaven for an hour and at least talk face to face with the divine. What questions might we ask? Fry asked about bone cancers. Others might ask about pancreatic cancer. Others might say, why did you make creatures that were capable of child abuse? Um, why are earthquakes always hitting the poorest people in the poorest countries? Why is there unending conflict in the so-called Holy Land? There's almost no limit to the questions we could ask of God and ask God, not simply out of curiosity, but because some have experienced these things and would want to know, want to know why the pain, why the grief, why so much uncontrolled variables in the human condition? If you get a chance to watch the Fry video clip, you might be struck by the passion with which Fry asked these questions. And in many ways, it mirrors the way Job asked questions, but there is a difference. Job in chapter 23 and in chapter 24, in which the suffering responds the suffering job responds to his friends who are pressing him to repent for the sins that they believe he must have done they see his losses again his losses in ministry as evidence that he's done something wrong something in his past something come on job admit to it they want a universe that makes sense they want a god that makes sense yet job maintains his innocence and will not but he also ad ad laments. He, he laments the fact that <coughs> there is no place for him to, to lay his case down. No place to plead not guilty. Oh, he says, oh, that I, if I knew where I might find him, I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would learn what he would answer me. <coughs> Job wants his hour with God and wants God to answer a question for him. And Job seems confident, confident that if he could only get such an audience, he'd be acquitted of if it is something he's done. We read the whole book of Job, of course. We find out, well, God does eventually respond to Job, not necessarily answering Job's individual questions. So what do we make of a God who doesn't answer? It's not how, it's not the how with the many questions we have for God. It's simply sometimes God's not going to answer them. Fry, the atheist that I referred to, is unlikely to have his questions answered. And we're unlikely to have ours answered either. That leaves us with two possible conclusions. Either there are no answers or Someone higher, higher than us, knows the answers. If the latter is the case, then we must proceed through life on the basis of faith, in that faith that someone has the answers, and that there is an answer. But for some reason, it's not revealed to us. Because sometimes, maybe, we really couldn't handle it. Looking at the poet, the work of the poet Maria Rilke, be patient toward all that is unsolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves like locked rooms or a book written in another tongue that you haven't learned yet. Do not now seek the answers which cannot be given to you because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live into everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps you will then gradually, without noticing it, live along some distant day into the answer. Living the questions. Well, that's very poetic. But what does it mean to live into the question? 
An unidentified author tells of being with a group that was in dialogue in the 1990s, and the dialogue consisted entirely, entirely of questions. Yet the author says they found the, prof the experience to be profoundly transformative. Sometimes these questions included statements masquerading as questions. Statements masquerading as questions like, why can't you be more forthcoming? Or why can't you be less stupid? You know, those, not really questions, kind of statements. Rhetorical questions, open-ended open -ended statements like, why? Questions that simply direct attention. Questions that modify, questions that overlap, questions that overlap or focus on some other question. Powerful questions simultaneously opening up and focusing attention. What they began to discover was that they were exploring something and ultimately, ultimately the questions take us deeper into the meaning of our lives. Answers, the problem with answers is sometimes they can be wrong. Sometimes they can be too simple or simply unsatisfying. The way I like to put it is sometimes answers to questions can take the awe out of things. Let's take a sunset, for example. Two people might look at a wonderful sunset with its wonderful oranges, and one might say, how does God make such awesome colors in the sky at sunset? And the other might say, oh, it's just particles in the air and the light reflecting off of them. Kind of takes the awe and wonder out of it. That is, we don't necessarily have to have answers for the questions in order for our questions to push out the boundaries of life. When we, when we live the questions in our conversations, we're in dialogue with the people around us. When the when we live the questions as a way of life, we're in dialogue with life itself. When we live the questions we have with God, we're in dialogue with God. In that regard, living a question is like living with a fruit tree that continually generates fruit for our nourishment, for our insight. There's nothing final, say, about a fruit tree a particular apple from the apple tree. More will follow. Not all are the same. They don't answer, but they nourish. And they're full of seeds as well to give rise to other apples. So it's instructive that some Christians groups have, have used or used questions to guide on a journey. Early Methodists did this Quite often in their class meetings where converts were divided up into smaller groups and under the leadership of a lay person, they would answer some open-ended questions. Of course, the first question was, how many of you practiced temperance this week? And they, those that had practiced temperance, meaning that they had refrained from drinking, would raise their hand. And that would be the teetotal, where we get the term teetotaler. But sometimes the questions were, how did you experience God this week? How did you experience Christian living this week? How did you live out Christian living this week? It's kind of like the, the youth, when the youth meet here and we ask them the how, pow, wows. What made you go wow? What made you go how? What hit you like a freight train this week? The group would pray together and pray for one another. And the questions... There was no right or wrong answer. There was just answers that each one lived into. Quakers did something similar with something called queries, a series of questions used for individual reflection, spiritual growth, and prayer. One Quaker, Martin Grundy, tells of an experience where the most recent query they discussed at the end of a rather long and tedious, long-winded, not particularly well-planned-out meeting the question was, how do we recognize what we're called to be obedient to? For the people who realized the silence deepened, lengthened, and then they suddenly realized that the question was so deep that the question brought them into the presence of God, and they found it good. 
In the end, that's what we should expect from our questions. Not answers, but a dialogue with life and the experience of God's presence in our daily days. Stephen Fry, the atheist I referred to, may never get to experience this dialogue or this presence of God because he's not initiating the conversation in faith. Yet Job had a question for God and got no answer. Yet Job remained faithful. Job remained convinced that God was real. Eventually questions would be answered or he would simply be in the company of God. Simply be in the, the company of God. This put him in the, a position to be comforted, to find strength, to find purpose. Even answers in the midst of questions that had no answers. And may our questions do that much for us that we may bring to the Lord. Well, we hope you've been enjoying our services both online and in person. Continue your generous support. We thank you so much in our ministries here just below the Arctic Circle. We always welcome your gifts of time and energy and talent and treasure. To find out how you can do more, you can call the office at 907 452 2956. And now, God of unending grace. Although there are times in our lives when we question why and when we wander from our path of faith, we still are forever grateful for the gift of life that is ours. And now pray that what we give will make this world better. We give our gifts knowing that they all originally came from you, the provider of all. Therefore, with grateful hearts, Grateful hearts, we return them through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please join us in singing How Great is Our God. Rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. It trembles at his voice, it trembles at his voice. How great is our God! Sing with me, how great is our God! And all
God, sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. We want to thank you for having joined us for worship here at First United Methodist Church in Fairbanks, Alaska. We are going to continue um, indoor services at 9 a.m. with a more uh, traditional bent, at 11 a.m. with the Praise Band and Praise Band Trio. Also at the 11 a.m. service, we offer Children's Church and Children's Choir as part of the 11 a.m. service. Also looking ahead, way ahead to September 18th, 2022, we're going to begin planning our 70th anniversary. Please pay attention to your midweeks and your church bulletin to see when those planning meetings are going to start. Um, we are planning the first one for September, or for October, actually. And beginning October 17th, we're going to begin Youth Sunday School, 10 a.m. to 1040 spreading out in the lounge. So as we gather, we come many times with our own sense of loss, of grief, of pain, of exhaustion, of the situation that continues to go on around COVID. Yet let's take that, let's take it to the Lord. Oh Lord, we confess there are times when we gather in prayer and we don't really understand why we do it. Because we don't understand the whys of life. In such times, our hearts are filled with sorrow at the magnitude of our loss, yet we're grateful, grateful for the life of love that has been ours. At such a time, we gather with heavy hearts. We come sometimes with pain too deep for words. We come anxious and unsure, doubting and angry, in disbelief and disquiet, in shock and despair, and yet we come and here you are, God, forever ready to listen, to listen than we are to pray. We confess that there are some things that we just cannot understand. And so many times you don't burden us with answers we can't bear. So we ask that you would help us to know your presence, because at such times it can be easier. We can feel the burden lift from us and know that you are God and your le love never lets go. So we come to you with those words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, and now go forth, thanking God for that word of eternal truths that speak to us day to day as we go forth. And we thank you for that living word of Jesus Christ and the sureness of his presence. Teach us how to turn to you so that our own thoughts, your own thoughts may be our thoughts as we go forth. Your own ways be our ways. And we will not need to ask the question, why? To trust you will be enough as we go forth. Amen. Join us in Better Than an Alleluia.
Hallelujah. 